Um, welcome to my presentation entitled From Cathedrals to God Home, The Art of Unstructuring Spatial Narrative. Uh, my name is Paul Garbazzi, and I am uh, an educator, a game designer, a researcher, and a doctoral candidate. Uh, and my research tends to look at, my interests in general, tend to look at how the intersections of digital spaces, digital games, uh, narrative, culture, and learning. And today, uh, I'm going to review a number of different sources to look at how we can enlist space and environment in order to advance narrative. Um, and as many of you know, uh, one of the challenges and opportunities of telling stories in, in, in modern, digital, and virtual spaces is the freedom afforded the user, the audience, uh, curtails traditional notions of nonlinear storytelling. So I'm going to draw from history, architecture, scholarship, and game design in order to see how we can use space in meaningful ways in order to advance story. Okay? So let's start with a quote. Uh, this is from a Kill Screen article, and I thought it beautifully encapsulates what I want to discuss today. And it's, spaces can be designed. They can be made to promote certain pathways, encourage specific behaviors, and even elicit emotional reactions. So this is the outward, uh, the outward aspect of storytelling, the emotional and cognitive engagement, not necessarily the, the linear plot structures. And I'm going to move from these, these wider considerations and slowly work towards how we can advance plot in a virtual environment by using space and environment. So let's start with the very first principle. The most basic idea here is that the environment is a text. Whether designed or not designed, environments invite a form of literacy, a form of understanding, a relationship. They can tell stories. We can read stories in them. And let's look at a few examples. This is a jungle. And when I look at this, I'm functionally illiterate. I don't really understand what's going here beyond this verdant entanglement of leaves and vines and trees and all sorts of things. However, if I were a biologist who would be familiar with this area, or a, a citizen or, or, or an inhabitant of this zone, this would be a very meaningful text to me. I can tell you what the individual species are, which are poisonous, which are salubrious. I may have stories tied to this area, whether something that happened to me or somebody that I know in this particular area. Uh, I could, uh, maybe there's myths or legends associated with this particular space. So, so you, you see the various degrees of literacy that we have when we encounter a space such as this one. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, this is where I am literate, which is uh, an urban scene, or a city. Uh, this is a corner of Paris, France. And when I see this, it speaks to me. I understand how to read this. I understand that traffic flows in certain ways, that the, the, the sidewalks are designated for pedestrians, that the colored lights govern the movement of traffic and people, um, and that these various signs indicate geographic areas that I can go to and orient myself with. Although I still don't understand some of the parking signs in Toronto. If you look at them, it's just a trouble with information. I think they intentionally try to trap you. Um, so, uh, but beyond that, uh, this corner, I, I met somebody backpacking in my youth, and this corner is where I last saw them. So I have a personal investment with this space. Uh, I also bought a scarf at the Ben Lux uh, shop across the street. So this is where I feel literate and the text speaks to me and it's woven with story and with narrative in terms of my personal experience with it. Now let's juxtapose the two, right? We have this, this verdant entanglement, as I said before, and then we have this urban space. And a series of binaries start appearing that you can read into it. We have structured versus unstructured, designed versus organic. We have order versus chaos, and then finally, uh, if you want to get a little bit metaphorical, we can see one as a metaphor for the conscious mind and the other for the unconscious or subconscious mind. Now, of course, these binaries are not absolute because we have a degree of order in this chaos. There is some structure to the leads and the patterns of nature. And similarly, we know that you know, cities can be very chaotic. Um, so there's this kind of mutual informing yin-yang relationship between these two spaces. But I find these useful because they, they set the outward order of storytelling. 
the sense that stories can be unstructured, or the way that we're seeing stories told uh, in the modern world can be very unstructured. And this starts with modernist and postmodernist literature now moving into games and digital spaces. But they continue also to be structured. And these are the two poles that uh, I'm going to discuss today in very convenient metaphors. Um, so let's uh, look at Don Carson for a second. Don Carson is an artist and illust an illustrator who designed amusement parks for Disney. And he wrote a series of articles for Game of Sutra, I think three of them. I'd recommend you look them up. They're written in 2000, 2000, and 2003, where he discusses the lessons he learned designing amusement parks as experiences, where he thinks of the, the person visiting the park as a character and wants them to feel like they're in a story as they move through that world. And he translates these lessons to game design and says, well, this is what I learned in, in the amusement park world, and this is what you should think about when you're designing space to tell stories in games in virtual environments. And this is a, ni a nice quote that, that underpins this, where he said that the story element is infused into the physical space. It is the physical space that does much of the work of conveying the story that designers are trying to tell. And we often think of the environment as an emotional space, but not a place that will actually um, relate plot or, or more specific meaning. But this counters that, that notion. Um, Cusco, Peru. Who's been to Cusco, by the way? Anybody here? Yeah? One person? Great. Great place. Magical. Uh, it is one of the most spectacular places on the face of this planet. It was the capital of the Inca Empire. Uh, when the Spaniards arrived, it was a thriving city of 200 to 300,000 people. The Incas were brilliant, a brilliant evolved culture that were astronomically sound and incredible things with agriculture. But one of the most impressive things that they did was their stone. They still don't really understand today how they created these stones that fit together so well without mortar and cement that you can't slip a hair between them. And it's, it's a beautiful city. I, I highly recommend it. But the reason I'm talking about Cusco today uh, relates to this, to this map and many others. This is a turn of the century map of Cusco, which means very little to you. But what's interesting is this. This is a puma that has been, it's a, a zoomorphic image that has been placed, uh, that the city has been designed around. And the puma has a very important significance in Inca cosmology. It's part of what's called the Inca Trinity, and that is that the condor is the lord of the upper world, the puma is the lord of the middle world, and the snake is the lord of the underworld. And the reason that the puma would have been the, 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 the governing design inspiration for the city is because the Incas in their city were living in the middle world. This was their most relevant deity. Um, they also not only worshipped it as a, as a divine creature, but as a source of personal inspiration because the puma is a highly adaptable animal that, that can go you know, to the snowy peaks of the Andes, but also hunt in the jungles. Uh, it, it's a very effective hunter. It's a beautiful animal. And in many ways, it, it, uh, it contains virtues and characteristics that the Inca highly regarded for their personal selves. So, um, so it's really interesting that they would design the space to reinforce their beliefs. So let's look at this more closely. The head of the puma is uh, the Saksaiwaman Fortress, which is the, the, the citadel that protected the city, this massive stone structure that is still impressive today. The picture that I opened with is, uh, is the main square, or the plaza, which is the heart of the puma, and then Corigancha, uh, which is the temple of the sun, one of the most important temples in the city, are its, uh, genitive, uh, its genitals. Um, and, and the other thing that's really interesting about this is that there's a, the, the outline of the animal is both uh, formed by roads and natural alleyways within the city, but as well by the confluence of two rivers. So they merge the kind of deliberate design element with the organic elements of the environment, which is, which is a feature of much of their construction um, and, uh, and, and building. So what's really interesting about this uh, is that the Incas then lived within their beliefs. This is their key deity, and, it was, and they were reminded of this any time they were walking within the city. There was a sort of, you know, they weren't necessarily aware of the shape all the time, but it was, it was subtly implied. And beyond that, there's a more insidious reason for this, is that the, the uh, theocratic power of the Inca, the ruler, uh, the king of the Inca people, was being reinforced. The system of beliefs, his power, his ability to build these things, 
his connection to the divine world was reinforced by this outward structure by which they shaped the city. So I discovered this whole notion of, of uh, the zoomorphic application of space from uh, a few guides in, in the area, in Peru. And beyond Cusco, they've actually, they, they say that Machu Picchu is shaped like a sacred bird. Uh, that Ollantaytambo uh, is, is an old man. And if you constellate all of the Inca cities and Dambos, which are the provisioning stations, it actually forms the image of a llama, another very sacred creature to the Incas. However, we've recently discovered, even not that recently, in the last 30 or 40 years, through rigorous scholarship, that we might be dealing with pareidolia. Pareidolia. What on earth does that mean? Well, it's not a Quechua word. It's an English word, believe it or not, with Latin origins, where we are reading patterns where patterns don't exist. That in fact, Cusco was not shaped like a puma. They've done research now that the city was built in such a sort of chronology that it's very unlikely that this was deliberate. However, it has become folklore with all of the Inca guides who may not be doing all the research in the academic databases. And, and also it's a nice story to tell the tourists and it really is evocative of the power of the Inca's ability to create things at such a grand scale. So it is a little disappointing. I'm disappointed. I was disappointed when I discovered this may not actually be the case. But it's a really important lesson that we will create patterns where patterns don't necessarily exist. So let's review a few, a few things. The three lessons of the Puma. One, environment can be shaped to reinforce content and beliefs. This is very important because this is what starts pushing a virtual space from a nice story into high art, where the form reinforces the content. Secondly, where you are determines who you are how we tie our identity to spaces. The Incas reinforce their sense of identity, their sense of cosmology, by living within the Puma. At least we, we could look at it that way. This is something that Don Carson discusses extensively when he's talking about uh, amusement parks and reminding your character who he or she is based on the environment that they inhabit. And finally, that brains will read patterns and stories from the chaos. So you can actually create a very suggestive environment that will be interpreted differently by different people. If I were to give you three images that are completely disconnected, you can form a story around those images. And in fact, we'll naturally try to form a story around those images. So let's move uh, from, uh, from the Inca Empire to 20th century Ireland. This is probably one of the most alienating works of literature ever written. If you ever pick up a copy of Finnegan's Wake and opens any page, you will be utterly confused about what is going on. Um, but I would argue that it may be the most important work of literature written in the last 500 years. And if you want to look into the crystal ball, uh, if you study this work, and uh, James Joyce, who wrote this, has anticipated much of the modern world. It was a huge influence on Marshall McLuhan, who's uh, the room across the way here is named after Mr. McLuhan. Mr. McLuhan read this book a few times. It's a really, really powerful book. Um, I have an unhealthy obsession with James Joyce. I have one of my former students and my wife here, and he'll tell you that I obsess about this guy a little bit too much. But there's some important lessons about, um, about spatial storytelling that Joyce innovated that we're seeing coming to the fore today. First of all, a little background on the book. It all, it's all one night's dream. It's just one dream that's lasting 600 pages. But at the same time, it's the nightmare of history. All of history, starting from our earliest origins to you know, New York City and Joyce's time, are woven into the text. So it's got the micro immediacy of the dream and the macro uh, context of history. Secondly, it all takes place in Dublin. Every word that Joyce wrote in his career was centered in Dublin. Even though he left Dublin in his early 20s, he then uh, only wrote about his muse. But he layers in all places, all cities, Rome, Babylon, New York, are all layered on top of Dublin with his use of words and symbols. So he's telling an archetypal story of all cities in all times with his uh, use of Dublin in its center. 
Also, it's the map of his unconscious mind. Joyce spent 17 years working through it. And part of the confusion of the work is, if I were to enter your subconscious mind, it would be a very, very confusing place. I mean, it would just be symbols and archetypes and emotions and things that are nonlinear and, and associated. And, and he, in some ways, renders the confusion of the unconscious mind. And you're, you're closest to your unconscious mind while you're sleeping, when all of a sudden your conscious mind steps back and your unconscious thoughts come to the fore. Um, and then finally, what it does really well, which we're seeing now as a great feature of augmented and virtual reality, is it compresses layers into simultaneity. Many cities are living at once in a single space. Many times are sharing a single time. And he does this with a very clever use of words and puns and, and all kinds of literary tricks because unlike you know, virtual reality and augmented reality, he was dealing with the written page. But I think he saw what was coming. But what's really interesting is this is how your mind works. Right? You have, you know, when we read a book, it's very much the conscious thinking that's on the surface, but your mind is complicated, and it's an archaeology of emotions and undercurrents that are all operating at the same time, and he captures this layering in the work. So it's not just a work about cities and history and the world, it's also a work that, that looks at the human mind, his own, and therefore all of ours, uh, in terms of its universal application. So we have a map of Dublin, the physical geography of Dublin. Um, and this is not a great map, it's a really bad tourist map, it's kind of fake, and, and it, it's not a mirror, it's just, it, it, it had something that I needed, which is the possibility of throwing this guy on top. This is the sleeping giant, Finn McCool. Uh, Finn McCool is why Finnegan's Wake, one of the reasons it's called Finnegan's Wake. And he was the great Irish hero, there's all these great myths about Finn McCool, and he made Ireland a great place to live, like getting rid of bad guys and monsters, and all kinds of things, much like Hercules or many other mythological creatures. And the myth is that he now sleeps under Dublin and one day will wake up to return to his former glory. Um, and, and we can interpret the dream of Finnegan's Wake as being Finn McCool dreaming, but it's not been determined. It could be the city of Dublin dreaming as a collective. We, we don't know what the dream is, but this is a good candidate. What's really interesting about Finn McCool is he is a Frankenstein amalgam of every hero and mythological person that Joyce could weave into his being. He's Osiris, he's Christ, he's uh, all kinds of gods and heroes from around the world, all subtly woven into one, that layer. And his body is perfectly blended with the geography of the city. This area here is called House Head, so a perfect place to plant his head. And this, where his feet are, is uh, Phoenix Park. Phoenix Park, of course, being the central park in Dublin. And Joyce loved the fact that he had Phoenix Park at the center of Dublin because his resurrection theme was reinforced by the idea of Phoenix being a bird that rises again, much like Finn McCool will. So what he's done is he's made memory, mythology, and story an integral part of the environment. He's woven the landscape to connect the anthropomorphic figure of the sleeping giant with the physical geography of his beloved city. But then he takes it one step further. We have now a better, oh sorry, before I go on. This is uh, an augmented reality. And what, what Joyce is doing textually in Finnegan's Way, we now can do with the technology available to us today. We can, we've, seen, we've all probably seen this, where you can take a historical picture and match it to its current uh, state and, and compare and be in awe of how things have changed over time. But what we can achieve with virtual and augmented reality is a simultaneity of time and space. We can have dialogues across time, dialogues across space, and change narrative structures accordingly. We can, we can create very rich narrative opportunities based on this. And here's my better map of Dublin. This is the center, the heart of Dublin. This is Dublin Bay up here. House Head would be there. We see Phoenix Park at the rear. Um, so I, if you look at the channel system, the main channels are that one, the Liffey River that goes through the middle and the channel on top. Well, I, I took the time to mark them out, right? So this, I don't know if it means anything to you, but what, what, it's, what it says to me, and I think was very apparent to Mr. Joyce, is that it's not unlike the human brain, woven right into the city. Uh, and, and this is really spectacular for a number of reasons. One is, when we live in design spaces, such as this room, such as the city around us, we are living inside of our brain. 
everything you see around you is ideas shaping the environment, right? This is all from human thought, from this one organ, we've created these designed environments. And he was very aware of this. He sees the city as an expression of the brain, and the brain as an expression of the city. Very McLuhan, right? This is where Mr. McLuhan gets his ideas. But what was even better, he delighted in all of these coincidences, is that you have the Liffey River flowing right through the center of his sleeping brain. So this is the flow of dreams and ideas, the stream of consciousness. And he pioneered, was one of the early pioneers in stream of consciousness writing. So it all works beautifully towards his ends. So the suggestion here is, if Finnegan's Wake is in fact a prescient work of literature that's anticipating the world to come and also, you know, sort of looking towards the past, then we are increasingly living in a dream that the worlds that we create will increasingly become dream-like. We are no longer constrained by physical reality, by physics and concrete. When we create virtual spaces, whether through augmented reality, mixed reality, or virtual reality, we are creating dream spaces. And if you are creating dream spaces, this challenges notions of narrative. Because you think, well, in this unstructured world, how do we tell a story? Well, one fundamental principle and one fundamental strategy that you should be looking at are, of course, archetypes. Archetypes structure our dreams and give coherence to our dream experience. And they actually make us feel like we're in familiar territory, even when our environment is unfamiliar to us. So let's look at some key archetypes. The tree is very important. It appears throughout literary history. It's a fundamental symbol in the early parts of all the sacred texts of the Western world. I mean, Buddha was enlightened under a tree. Uh, the, the, in the Garden of Eden, the tree is a central symbol. And this speaks to a long history that we, as, as a species, have with trees for food, for protection, for all kinds of things. Um, and you know, in Game of Thrones, one of the central you know, sort of uh, mystical places is, of course, the tree. And its branching structure, of course, speaks to genealogy and, and the branching sort of forking of life. Then we have the forest. The forest is, uh, is a metaphor for the subconscious. It is a place where, where it is both fearful but inspiring. Uh, it speaks to being lost, perhaps, to trying to find your way through a problem or a difficulty, and to some degree, terror. The cave. The cave is indicative of the womb and the tomb, right? It's this encloistered area that could give life, but also take life away. It is a place for protection, but also a place for imprisonment. Sometimes you can, you can be caught in a case. It's a very powerful metaphor. The mountain. Uh, the mountain is, is a, a beautiful geographic feature, and the challenge of rising to the summit uh, and then achieving a goal is invested in this. It's also associated with spiritual enlightenment, getting close to heaven or divine forces, many positive associations with mountains. But then we have the garden. What's interesting is we've moved from naturally occurring archetypes to an archetype where there's a deliberate human design meeting nature. And it's no coincidence, I believe, that the Garden of Eden is the very first story in the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah, because what we have is, these are stories of civilization. And this is the most basic way in which we start the process of civilization, because this is the, most, the, the simplest and most elementary example of how human hands shape nature. This is, you know, this is what eventually evolves into a city. So it's a very powerful meta metaphor about the relationship between human agency and uh, nature. We go to the labyrinth. This is almost now the garden has become even more artificial. And the labyrinth is also a very powerful metaphor because it is a, a metaphor for life, for moving through all the difficulties, the dead ends, and the challenges in order to achieve your goal. And, and life can feel like a labyrinth, much like a city can. And then finally, this is GTA 5, by the way, for any GTA 5 fans. Uh, this, is, this is the city. And what's fascinating about the city is that it, it incorporates all the uh, archetypes that I've used so far. You can think of it as a labyrinth. Of course, it's like a forest of buildings. These are individual trees. The interiors are caves, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this, of course, is a very, very powerful archetype and one that Joyce uses very effectively and, and speaks to much of our human condition as we've become urbanized in the last 6,000 years of history. So what are the lessons? five lessons of the way. One, 
Stories, memory, and mythology are not the place. In design spaces, we inhabit our minds. Many times can coexist in one space. Many places can coexist in one space. And archetypes ground us in the familiar. All very important when you're considering storytelling, using space, and environment. This is Gideon's Cathedral in France. It is a magnificent building uh, that was built in the 13th century. It, all, it only took 68 years to build, which sounds like it's, it takes a long time, but in cathedral terms, that's a speedy process. It took three generations of architects to put it together. It has been called the Bible carved in stone, an encyclopedia of the Bible carved in stone. And what they, I, 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 you know, that, that similar to the city, it incorporates all of the archetypes that I've just discussed. Every one of them, you know, the tree would be the individual column, the forest are all the columns, the cave is the nave, the mountain is its imposing structure over these small medieval towns, and its collective desire is to uh, impose the idea of the city of God. It's meant to invoke what the taste of heaven will be like, and I'll discuss this in a little bit more detail. But let's look at the outward appearance first. Almost every story in the Bible from the Garden of Eden to the Apocalypse has been carved into the structure, whether in the, the, the coral pews, uh, on the interior, through paintings, on the stained glass windows, and in the exterior facades that are very, very elaborately carved. And their arrangement is all very symbolic and it's very powerful. So this is almost the literal level. And remember that biblical text, and, and some people would say literary text, can be interpreted at four different levels. So this is a, the kind of surface level. Then you walk inside, and it is an awe-inspiring experience. This is the highest ceiling of any cathedral in France, in, in the Athens Cathedral. It's about 120 kilometers north of, of Paris. Um, the, 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 the rows of columns that lead you to the rear of the nave, it's a mesmerizing experience. It's almost hypnotic, this, this, this pattern of repetition. Gothic architecture, uh, rather than the Roman art, which is quite rounded, point upward, and the ribbed uh, vaults on the ceiling also point upward. So everything in this structure lifts the person towards the sky, reminds them that the most important stuff is going on upstairs. So it's a really impressive building. And what is also quite impressive is the amount of natural light. Because one of the great features of the Gothic cathedral, one of the great innovations of the Gothic cathedral, were the flying buttresses, these kind of structures that you see, uh, these ribs on the side of the, of the building. And what they do is, they support the incredible amount of weight from this structure uh, pushing down into the ground. Prior to that, before the buttresses, you couldn't really build windows into these structures because you needed every single brick to support the weight. Once you had flying buttresses, you could create these large, magnificent windows to allow the natural light to stream in through the colored glass. So that's, and all of this is an emotional and psychological experience to reinforce the stories that you see carved around you. This is then a floor plan of the cathedral, and of course, it's not uncommon, and you probably know this, we see the element of the cross. Here we have the giant, the puma, and now the cross to reinforce the beliefs in the mapping of the structure. These are the transepts and the nave. Uh, and, and the cross is built into it. But this is kind of simplistic. I don't I mean it's not that impressive. It almost falls naturally with the construction of the cathedral. But this is impressive. Every aspect of this building's construction was 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 very, very deliberately tied to numerology and what's called sacred geometry, which reinforces all the belief systems in the sacred book. So starting with the center here, there's something called the golden mean or the golden ratio, which was developed by the Greeks. Which is, a, which is a proportion that is said to be transcendental and, and particularly pleasing. And every aspect of the floor plan and layout and the height is developed around the golden mean. Um, uh, you have the, the positioning of the structure, of course, is east-west, as all sacred buildings are in Christianity. The floor plan also, if you look at it with the transept and the main part of the nave, is a perfectly proportioned human body to celebrate the perfection of Christ and the perfection of man, which was the, the, the creation of God, his greatest creation. So nothing in this building is arbitrary. Every square inch of the place has been designed to speak to the numerology and geometry which they believe tied into a notion of heaven or the divine. And most people would miss this. 
Most people who walked into these buildings would be clueless to the, the, the amount of detail that was put to reinforce the beliefs. But like a sacred text, you know, the, what the pastor reads in the church are the, the, you know, the very sort of surface level stories for moral behavior. But the rabbinical scholars that are digging into it are seeing all the patterns emerge that have been woven into the language of these sacred books. And the cathedral does not disappoint. It maintains all those levels of meanings that we find in the Bible. An unusual feature of onions is that there's a labyrinth on the floor, this particular part of the floor plan. This is unusual and not unusual. Chartres has probably, another cathedral in France, probably has the most famous labyrinth uh, in, in all of France. And, and what's interesting about this is it's kind of pagan. Like, I mean, the labyrinth is, is not really a Christian symbol. But there's a few reasons for its presence in Amiens. First of all, the architects saw Daedalus as their patron saint, even though he wasn't a saint, because he was the great engineer of the ancient world. And of course, he's the one that created the labyrinth in which the Minotaur lives. Um, and so the architects really liked the idea of having a labyrinth as a celebration of this huge accomplishment that they did. Uh, and, and actually, Amiens is often known as the House of Devils, oddly enough. Um, but the, the second reason is it's a metaphor for the pilgrimage of the soul, the, the trials and, and errors that you make in life as you try to get to heaven. So the very path to heaven is built into a structure that's meant to evoke heaven and heavenly life out of earth. So everything is enlisted towards this narrative, this story of salvation, of divinity, and of life after death. I mean, it's an incredible piece of visual storytelling. And the, the labyrinth is not trivial. Every aspect, you can spend hours on the internet looking at the interpretations, the mathematics, of the meanings. It is an unbelievably simple object on the surface and unbelievably complex underneath, much like the cathedral itself. So let's go back to the 13th century. And we are a worshiper in this temple. We walk in, and it's the magnificence of its magnitude. We we're all living in little mud huts and groveling for our miserable little lives, and off we go. And then we walk into this thing, which is unbelievable in its magnitude and size and, 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 and almost divine when you walk in. Then we hear the choir, this incredible choral experience, this auditory experience. And we're not hearing music at home on our iPads or, or, or on our stereo systems. We are, we, we're not exposed to this richness of auditory experience. So this is overwhelming as well. We have a guy walking around spreading incense, stimulating our noses, our olfactory sense, and creating kind of a smoky, mystical environment. We have beautiful colored light coming in from stained glass windows, which we wouldn't see colored light anywhere else, right? So this is very unique on all fronts. And then finally, it's all nicely tied together with a few drops of wine to get you into the right frame of mind to bring all of these different features together. And what all of this does is it gives you a taste of heaven. Think of this. Think of this experience, the music, the light, the smells, the sounds, all of this coming together. Well, this is what you are going to get for the rest of eternity if you play your cards right. And I would argue that this might be one of the earliest examples of virtual reality. They appeal to all of our senses. They create a virtual form of heaven on earth, the city of God. Uh, and, and it's no coincidence that the biggest industries in the world are now developing virtual reality. Well, this was the biggest industry in the world during the Middle Ages. So what are the four lessons of Amiens? Uh, environments can be designed to produce emotion. Environments can be designed to be transcendental. Environments can transmit multiple levels of meaning. And environments can perform multiple narrative functions and remain unified and cohesive. That unified and cohesive stuff is not so important in the postmodern world, but it's kind of awesome that they were able to do it in this kind of unified form. Now let's move to the rhizome. Um, the rhizome is, uh, there's a woman named Janet Murray, who if you're interested in this stuff, you should read her book, Hamlet on the Holodeck. It's an early sort of book that looked at how do we tell stories in virtual spaces. It's highly recommended. She says that in, in the storytelling world, the two kind of metaphors are the labyrinth, beginning, middle, end, goal-oriented, and the rhizome, which is wide open. So what is a rhizome? It's a continuously growing horizontal underground stem that puts out lateral shoots and adventitious roots at intervals, right? So it's kind of a lot of tubular stuff. You see this root system going out and things going 
willy-nilly all over the place. But how does this relate to narrative? Well, there's a, there's a French philosopher named uh, Gilles Deleuze who wrote about rhizomes in 1985 and really looked at them as one of the great guiding metaphors of the postmodern world, as affecting all aspects of the postmodern world. In fact, I spoke to somebody recently who told me that the way that Israeli soldiers penetrate the West Bank on an assault is rhizomic. They actually intentionally use a rhizomic pattern in order to be unpredictable and unexpected in the way that they conduct their assaults, which is horrifying and interesting all at the same time. Um, so, the rhizome has no origin or closure. It's non hierarchical, unlike the tree, right? Because the tree has a hierarchical, so this is a, a horizontal system. Uh, it's non binary. We live in a non -binary, binary world. We're trying to kind of dissolve binaries in the modern world. Connected multiplicities, things that you don't think connect actually do connect or can be connected together. And it is network-like. And this might be the most important thing, because the same way that the Puma was guiding the Inca and that the cross is guiding Christianity, the network is probably one of the most dominant metaphors of our time. And will be uh, will, will affect every aspect and has affected many aspects of modern life. So we can say that. The labyrinth relates more or less to the city. These are not, you know, these are these are formulaic, and I'm always a suspicious of formula. And the rhizome is evocative of that jungle space, the organic and design space, and the, the interweaving of the two creates all possible story uh, structures and forms. But how do we unstructure or structure experience in unstructured rhizome? Environment. So you have this open world in that all kinds of things can happen. You can do whatever you want within your virtual world. How does that become a story, right? So there's many, many ways to respond to this. But I have one that I like, my personal favorite. And I turned to a group of wacky artists called the Situationists. The Situationists were a Marxist group of artists led by a self-proclaimed drunk named Guy Debord. Who, who believed that we lived in a society of the spectacle. And drawing from Marxist ideas felt that the commodification of modern life was alienating us from each other, but also from our environment. And they wanted to create uh, uh, ways in which we could enliven and reinvigorate our relationship with our environment and with each other in artistic, interesting ways to awaken us from our sleep and how we relate to our cities. So a fundamental principle of uh, of the situation is something called psychogeography, which is specific effects of the geographical environment, whether consciously organized or not, on the emotions and behaviors of individuals. And this has been proven by, by behavioral psychology. I mean, our environments influence so much of our behavior, of our attitude, of our identity, and they saw this. And they thought that cities were horrifying failures in terms of how they made us feel and how they invited us to interact with them. And they started by thinking, well, we got to change cities, but then that wasn't going to happen. So then they went to, well, we got to change how we interact with cities. So they devised a cool little thing called a derive. And a derive literally means to drift. And, and this concept of urban drifting, which they define as one or more persons during a certain period drop their usual motives for movement and action, their relations, their work, and leisure activities, and let themselves be drawn by the attractions of the terrain and the encounters they find there. So that, I don't know if you process that, but an example is, I walk exactly the same path to work every single day, and I am completely on automatic pilot. That part of the city has died for me. I no longer notice anything because I get inside of my head as opposed to outside of it. Well, if I were to meet a situation, he says, well, I have, I have a, a proposal for you. Mark five different paths to your workplace. Every one of them may not be efficient, but they are different and varied. And in the morning, put them on a deck of cards, pick one up, and then take that path because it will awaken you to your environment. And that's very much derived type thinking. And it says it will, it will make you see the city in a different way, experience your environment in a different way. So here are some good little derive ideas. Uh, one is drawing on a map, you know, maybe a puma, in this case a three-headed dragon or dog, and then follow, just see where it takes you, what, what alleyways and what streets that you would never think of visiting in your own city would appear from this. There are apps that you can download from your phone that will allow you to conduct derives or derive apps. 
Um, there are these great cards called City Walks, um, where they have all types of walks with information on the back of the card. Shuffle the deck, pull one out, and that's the walk that you're going to do to explore a part of your city or another city that you may not be familiar with. And, and this, has, this speaks to urban environments. But you can create this within virtual spaces. You can give uh, users goal-oriented objectives or encourage this kind of dream. So where's the story in this? Right? This is the question. Where's the story in this? Well, this goes to a concept that Henry Jenkins discusses at length, which is called emergence. That the story emerges as it is happening. It's not a design story, but I'll tell you, when you come back from that city walk and you're sitting at the dinner table with your friend or your family and you're telling them about it, there's the story. That's the story of what happened to you. It's very personalized. It's very individual. We don't have to railroad our audiences in order to create narrative experiences. And that's a very important lesson from my friends, the situations. And it, I can't help but think of this, right? I mean, let's face it, it's not a fantastic game, uh, it, but, but it, what, what a cultural phenomenon. All of a sudden, you see packs of people roving about the city, places that have been virtually abandoned, have you know, people huddled around waiting for one of these you know, these creatures to show up, and all of a sudden, people awoke to their city. It was a nice four or five month span before interest started waning, that, that, that everything had changed. And I find this promising, because if this is a first step where there's going to be more deliberate opportunities to augmented reality or virtual reality, to re-engage with their city in a meaningful way and awake from our sleep, where we're, we're, we're just using it in a very functional way, I think it's actually quite positive. So the four lessons of the rise on are environmental narratives can be emergent and non-linear. Okay, Envi thank you. Environments can be repurposed for personal goals. Narratives do not have to have a beginning, middle, or end. And narrative spaces can be navigated in the spirit of ludic adventures. I don't even remember where I got that from. It's not mine, but it's, I like it. Ludic adventures. Ludic means playful or playing. Um, which takes us to Gone Home, which is what was on the, 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 the program. That's why I have to talk about this. But it's a fantastic game. Has anybody played Gone Home or is aware of it? Cool. Maybe that's why you guys all showed up. It's, it's great. <laughs> so, uh, designed in 2000, well, released in 2013, developed by a group of four people in Portland, Oregon, led by Steve Gang, a uh, really brilliant game design guy. Um, and a very simple game. You're Kate Greenbrier, you're 19 years old, you've been in Europe for a year, uh, backpacking in 1995. Very little communication with your family. They have inherited a big old mansion somewhere in Oregon. You return home to this mansion on the night that, uh, you know, the, the night you, you get dropped off from the airport by the van, and the game begins on the front porch of the house, and nobody's home. There's a note, a weird note from your sister saying, listen, you're going to find some weird stuff, don't tell mom and dad, and mom and dad are home. You don't know why. So you walk into the house, and you explore and you start opening drawers and looking at closets and snooping around and figuring out what happened to my family during the year that I was away. Um, this is a masterpiece in what is called embedded narrative. This is a concept that was, uh, that was again, formulated by Henry Jenkins. It, it, I mean, he kind of encapsulated it. There were people who were talking about this before him. Now, what embedded narrative is, and this is where we get to the specifics of creating plot in the environment, is by using artifacts and cues in the environment in order to tell a story. So uh, Jenkins says that a game designer can somewhat control the narrational process by distributing the information across space, right? Not time, but space. You distribute the information, and it's open access. You can access it in a variety of ways. And what's really interesting, so this is, these are some artifacts in Gone Home. There, there are tapes and letters and journal entries and, I love the fact that there's a, there's a book called Joyce of Complete Understanding the Irony is Thick uh, that you find in the basement. And, and then this little card here that says, Happy Birthday, Sam Uncle Hard, that you actually find in the entrance kind of wedged in under a bureau. So um, what seems like a meaningless object uh, is actually very important. I'll talk about it in a second. But regardless of how you access this information and these artifacts, no matter the order, your brain builds the story. You actually take the puzzle pieces and naturally, and it is a powerful story. I mean, some people hate this game. It's the most polarizing game in the world. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I got kind of emotional at the end. And it doesn't matter how you access the different artifacts, you will still get to the same story. And you still feel like you know these people, you care about these people, but you never meet another person in the game. You don't even see yourself. It's completely disembodied, which is very powerful. 
Um, so Harvey, Uncle Harvey, is Harvey Smith. Uh, Steve Gator sent him a, a request to write a note, and they embedded it because they wanted to reference Harvey Smith because of the work he'd done in environmental storytelling. So environmental storytelling relies on the player to associate disparate elements and interpret them as a meaningful whole. And that's a really important lesson. You don't have to lay things out in chronological order. You can fill a space with objects, and no matter what the order those objects are accessed, leave it to the human mind to bring them together in a meaningful way, and in a directed way, that you can actually lead them to a narrative event. So what I love about Gone Home is it's rhizome and labyrinth all squished into one. Um, I'm going to detour from Gone Home a little bit to talk about Sleep No More. This is one of the big shows of the world right now. It's in London and New York, and it basically, you wander around a huge warehouse wearing a mask. It's participatory theater where you are part of the experience, you can see the show six times and you'll never have the same experience twice. Well, this was inspired, according to Sid Barrett, the artistic director, by video games. And Steve Gator said, well, it was actually my seeing Sleep No More that inspired Gone Home. So it's really beautiful to see the digital world bouncing out into the physical world and then back into the digital world again, and how we are now using these non-linear spatial narratives in, in other art forms as well. Escape Rooms are another great example of how you can use an endless space to tell a story or suggest a story um, in, in a physical environment. And Don Carson, our friend from the amusement park, says, staged areas can lead the game player to come to their own conclusion about a previous event or to suggest a potential danger just ahead. So what he means by this is what's called cause and effect, um, which is you can see this and you have a story. What happened here? Was some kind of a sleepover, they had pizza, they were playing some kind of a card game, uh, you know, she might have a cold, and if you were to see what she was reading, it would be significant. So an environment can tell a story just by simply having evidence of something that happened there in the past. Also, Gone Home is part of a wide intertextual referential network. This is Ken Levine's Bioshock Infinite, which is referenced in a salad dressing bottle in the kitchen. They all worked for Bioshock before they worked on Gone Home. So they're referencing their roots, but also implying that Gone Home is part of the Bioshock universe. This is Firewatch. In your bag, you find a book called The Accidental Tourist by Terrence Greenbrier. This book was written by Katie's dad, and there are copies of it all over the Gone Home house. So there's a reference there. And then after the game was re-released for console, Steve Gaynor made a reference to Firewatch by including an artifact that is from the Firewatch universe. And this is the number 0451, which is, which is a very famous number in the video game world. It's what unlocks the cabinet for Greenbrier's study. And, uh, and it's a number that's been used in all kinds of games like Deus Ex, like Bioshock. And it comes from uh, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, the temperature at which paper burns. And it's, it might be a subtle reference saying the age of paper is behind us. We are now telling stories in the digital age. I don't know if that's what they meant, but I like that idea. So uh, it's not just about telling the story. Gone Home is a central exploratory viruistic experience. And this is atmospheric. And this is also part, an important part of the narrative experience. Um, and, and before we end, I want to talk very quickly about artifacts as environments. This is a game called A Normal Lost Phone, where you find a phone and you have to figure out the passwords and dig into the text messages and, and the social media networks. And a story unfolds, an LGBTQ story unfolds about a young girl coming to terms with her sexuality simply by accessing her phone. So I, I think in this case, the artifact becomes an environment. It's almost gone home condensed into a single cell phone. What I like the idea is, is putting a cell phone like this in Gone Home, you know, setting virtual reality goggles in that space, and then you have this, uh, uh, this, this, this explosion of narrative possibilities by combining them together. So the six lessons of Gone Home are narrative can be embedded in the environment, evocative references enrich and extend the story, players build and organize stories in their heads, exploring aesthetically pleasing places enhance narrative, nonlinear environments can tell author linear stories, Artifacts can be environments. So, uh, I'm going to end with a few inspirational sources. Environmental authoring is a multidisciplinary endeavor. It draws from all kinds of different places. And, and this makes it exciting. I love reading about all these different elements and feeding into the opportunities for narrative. So here are some places you may want to look. Architecture. 
urban planning, visual arts, landscape architecture, video game design, interactive fiction, behavioral psychology, and set design. All of these have done work where they talk about the relationship between environments and, and, uh, and, and storytelling. And, and fundamentally, aside from these, be mindful of your own lives. Think about how you have your relationships with space and how they affect you. And make note of these observations and see how then you can weave this as a user or as a designer to create compelling, inspiring, artful, and meaningful stories in space. Thank you. Any questions? Anecdotes? <laughs> Concerns? Yeah? So if you uh, reconcile this with the idea of presence, mm -hmm. right? so we, you know, we see these talks you know, every year there's an like this. So really, I mean, essentially, like, the rule is there are no rules except for your life. Right. Right. So, well, it, what, there's, that's one of the many possibilities. I mean, Gone Home is an example where there is some rule that, that has been attached. And you're somewhat guided in Gone Home. Right. So they find, so I think, but, but what, what's important is that we become comfortable with the idea that you can have unstructured spaces and that narratives will naturally emerge. So, so the question is, right, so how do you get users to adopt uh, unstructured um, ways of doing things? Because it essentially breaks presence, right? Like, right. Um, well, there's a few things. You can weave them into it. You can move from a structured element and slightly start uh, uh, making it less structured, or offer choice and opportunity within the world where they can choose a more structured option or choose an unstructured. Just like GTA, right? GTA, you can follow the campaign, or you can just drive around and check out the sunset. So I think that, that by giving choice, which is something that games do very well, uh, you can you can certainly deal well with those types of situations. Thank you very very much. Take care.